When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Let us pray. Lord Christ, we are so unworthy of the gift of your son and the redemption that he brought, but boy, are we glad that you did. Pray now that you would prepare all of our hearts, Lord, to to hear your word as it has been read, to open my lips as I attempt to explain it, that your people might be blessed, and I might be encouraged, and that we would all be renewed by your word and understanding of our adoption as sons. We ask this for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So this is uh, one of those interesting Sundays where an important feast of the church here that's affixed to a certain date also happens to fall on a Sunday. And so New Year's Day is always a celebration of the name of Jesus, which is our salvation. Um, but I preached on that a couple of weeks ago, didn't I? Remember the whole Yeshua thing and all that, yeah? Uh, so I'm hoping that's sticking with you. I, I want to continue in the Christmas spirit. This is the first Sunday after Christmas, and we're not nearly finished with the 12 days of Christmas yet, so... Um, it's still Christmas time, and, and I want to really, um, I do want to talk about the, this bit at the end of that first, that first sentence in your epistle reading. You might pull your, epistle, your, your bulletin out and look at that reading from Galatians. We're going to focus mainly on that first sentence in that reading. And I really want it, we're going to end up talking about our adoption as sons, by, as legitimate children of God. All right, so women, it's not this excluding you. We're all legitimate heirs is what he's getting at here. Um, but that's going to have to be my second point this morning because I, I want to focus more on our redemption. Um, I'd like to take it for granted and move on to adoption, but I can't for numerous reasons. We're gonna, I re- we really need to do this all the time um, because to really rethink on the grace of God and, and our redemption, the fact of of him coming to save us. Because we get, um, we're, we're steeped in a line of thinking that, that gets grace all wrong. So we've got to continue to nail this down before we can get into one of the products of grace, which is our adoption as his son, right? So, uh, you know, what do I mean by all that? I want to think about it for a few minutes. Um, what do bad little boys and girls get in their stocking at Christmas? They get coal, right? Um, he's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town, right? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. That's kind of unsettling, isn't it? <coughs> Get out of my bedroom, Santa. You know? <laughs> he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. So the all-seeing eye is watching your behavior, yeah? He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You, yeah. That's not exactly an encouraging line. You better watch out. Right? You know, this song, ever since it came out almost 90 years ago, is an instant success in 1934. This song has infected our Christmas with an anti gospel message. You know, our modern day myth of Santa, what it's become in the last 90 years or so, I think thanks in large part to that song, right, um, is completely contrary to the gospel. Could not be more different. You know, I'm not against Saint Nick. The real Saint Nick loved Jesus, and because he loved Jesus, he, he gave presents to poor children and orphans, and he punched heretics, which not to like, right? Um, but the real Satan could be horrified at the anti-gospel spin we've put on Christmas in his name. Right? I mean, think about it. What does that song teach us? If you behave, you'll get good things. And if you do not behave, you get nothing. Right? That is not... How is that good news? There's nothing good news about that. That's called getting what you deserve. And let's face it, there are a whole lot of kids and adults who got presents they didn't really deserve this Christmas, didn't they? Right? Let's pray we never get what we deserve. Right? You know, I dare say that most of us do, though, operate under this form of religion. And we call it the faith, you know, religion of Jesus Christ. 
but it is the exact opposite of the real gospel. And here's what we do. We, we make sure to convince ourselves that we're not as notorious a sinner as... I mean, nobody's perfect, but at least I'm not as bad as, you know, those yahoos, right? And, you know, and I hear this kind of stuff all the time. You know, I, Father, I, I've, I've got to deal with the man upstairs. We have an understanding. He and I are good, right? I mean, you tell me that you laugh, but you tell me this stuff all the time. You know, we're good. I, I've not... I've not led a perfect life, but you know, God knows that I'm decent and I try my best. And, and you know, when I get up there, those pearly gates, I'm sure that with a wink and a nod, St. Peter's going to sort of crack it open and, and he's going to let me slip through, you know. You think like that more than you're letting on. You're all laughing. <laughs> That's how we tend to think. Um, but beloved in Christ, that is not Christianity. That is, in fact, the message that Jesus was most opposed to. Jesus was directly against that version of the so-called gospel. Right? This line of thinking is death and it leads to hell. I mean, we tend to think we've, we do our best, and then Jesus meets us the rest of the way with mercy to cover the balance, right? And it all washes out in the end. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's garbage. You see, either we enter into that form of religion... Um, supremely and arrogantly and falsely confident in the deal that we think we've got implicitly with God. Or we enter into that arrangement fearful and uncertain, constantly wondering, I hope my sins aren't a bit too much. And I hope Jesus' mercy will actually reach down to someone like me. And if that's the way we're thinking, but you're not sure about that gap, you know? And so you spend your life, all, your Christian life ultimately um, and, and fearful, in a state of anxiety and dread, being afraid of the end and living in a, with a sense of guilt and shame. This is not good news. Either being falsely confident or living under the fear of condemnation. What is the good news of Jesus Christ all about? What is the simplest definition of grace I think you can give is this. Getting good things you do not deserve. That is grace. God gives us what we do not deserve. So let's clear that up right now. Right? And then the mercy is a very similar definition, but it's sort of flipped around a little bit. The mercy of God that we get in Jesus Christ is not getting the bad things we do deserve. So you hear that? We get the good we don't deserve, and we don't get the bad that we do deserve. You know, we, we've got to get this, you better watch out kind of business Santa Claus coming to town kind of religion. Out of our minds. We've got to rip it out of our hearts. We know, let's face it, I mean, really, for 90 years, roughly, that, that song has been a trick to work on our kids and grandkids just because we want them to stop being annoying. All right? That's the kind of garbage we tell them. But it infects their soul with the wrong understanding of the grace of God and how Jesus Christ works and what he is about. They need, our children, our grandchildren, ourselves, we need to hear about the radical grace of God every chance we get. Because when we are constantly rooting out the false religion, the false conception, and putting in the true gospel of the grace of God, you know, this will begin to work its way into their souls, right? And we need to get rid of the death of the old moralistic preaching of works and and, this, and if we can get this message in them early, it will stick with them through adulthood. That will be the imprint on their little souls that they will remember, that they are radically loved. In spite of what they deserve. And the more you tell your kids that, you might begin to rip the roots out of that out of, your, of, your, out of, of that out of your own heart and start believing it actually yourself and applying it to yourself as a parent and a grandparent and etc., no, children need to hear about the free and the glorious grace of God from the very earliest age. See, where Santa hands out coal to bad boys and bad girls, right? Jesus offers those same bad boys and bad girls the gift of himself and eternal life. Give your worst kid the best gift. You know, and tell them that you're doing this because Jesus and you love them. 
And you want for nothing more than this love to transform their lives. You do this and it will begin to work. I mean, we, we've got to get away from this good works business. I mean, yes, do good works, but that is not our salvation, all right? We've got to get away from it. We contribute nothing to our salvation but the sin which made it necessary, okay? So let's just realize that, call it what it is. He came, Jesus came to seek and to save, not the mildly competent. He didn't come to seek and save the decent, the good boys and the good girls. No, he came to seek and save who? The lost. God shows his love for us in this. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right? God made him who knew no sin to be sin. So that we might become the righteousness of God. All right? These two messages could not be any more different. And where am I getting all this? I'm not just hating on Santa here. <laughs> this is in our Galatians reading, in that first line. Um, all I'm doing is reflecting on this line where Paul says that God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. You know, well, it's not, well, this is so bad being under the law. I mean, isn't it better than no law? Well, yeah, it is. But to know what this means, to, to redeem those of us who were under the law, right? You've got to understand why the law was given to Israel, the law of Moses, and what its effect was. And so remember, God looked down on mankind and he saw the, the condition, the true condition of our hearts, which is evil continuously, we hear uh, in the narrative before Moses. And so, through Israel, he ends up giving the law, and he gives it for two reasons. Number one, the first reason is so that we could see what righteousness actually looks like. The expectations of righteousness, what a righteous person really looks like and acts like, and, and all that, right? That's the first reason. The second reason is this. By seeing that, we then see how unrighteous we are in and of ourselves. That's why the law was given. You know, no one could ever, no one in the Bible, apart from Jesus, ever got past the first of Moses' two tablets, right? The first four commandments have to do with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. No one ever could do that, let alone get to the second tablet of the law, the rest of the six, which are loving your neighbor as yourself. All we really want to do is love ourselves. And let's face it, we're not that good at it. We're pretty terrible at even loving ourselves, all right? Outside of the wisdom and the saving grace of God. Virtually everyone in Jesus' day and virtually everyone in our day misunderstands the giving of the law. They treat it like a ladder by which we can climb up to God. If I do X, Y, and Z and I cross my T's and dot my I's and do everything just right and don't smoke, don't smoke drink, or chew or go with girls that do, if I just live a clean life, right? That's a little blessing for my childhood for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I just do all these things, then God and I will be okay. I'll be closer to God, and, and He'll be closer to me then, and we'll love each other, and it's going to be fine. We'll meet, sort of meet in the middle with it. That is trash. That is not the gospel. That is not why the law was given. That is an abuse of God's good gift of the law. The law of God is not a ladder by which we climb to God. It is a mirror by which we see our true selves. And when we see our true selves, when we see our true condition, this realization is not meant to shame us, but it is to get us to call out to God for help, for salvation. Save me from my sin, we pray, when we see the truth about ourselves in the Word. Save me from my sin. Save me from my corruption. Save me from my condemnation. That's the point of the law. And this is what makes the birth of Christ so wonderful. And the, the, the thing when he came bursting into this world, right? Born of a woman, Paul says in our reading. Born under the law. Because in all the saints in the Bible, in Old Testament, New Testament, everybody in church history, there's only been one being, one person who fulfilled that law perfectly. And his name ain't you, it's Jesus. All right? I had to burst your bubble. It was Jesus and not you. And salvation is found not in doing things, 
but in trusting in what he has done, his perfect and righteous life, and his sacrifice for you, right? Because he was born, number one, to satisfy the righteous requirement of God, and he was born, number two, to take on our condemnation, suffering execution so that you and I won't have to, right? Suffer the just punishment of everlasting torment and separation from God. That's why he came. And I have to remind you of this all the time. Because number one, I need to hear it. And I need to hear myself saying it. The more I say it, the more I believe it and trust it and apply it to myself. So partly selfish in this, alright? But number two, you need to hear it. And I'm going to keep finding different ways to say this same message. Again, because I need it and because you need it. And let's be candid here. Um, you all law are not always able to repeat it back to me. When I ask you, how are you and God, how's your faith? Are you at peace with God? And I hear, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm doing all right. You know, God and I are pretty good. Right? I hear that kind of stuff come out of you all the time. And I want to keep hammering this until, I, until it's imprinted in your soul. Until you, you dream about it subconsciously. And the grace of God and, and the power of the gospel is just, is just so part of the fabric of your being, right? That you will just give it back to me. And you'll tell me that you're good because of what Jesus Christ has done and how much you love him. All right? So that's one reason why I keep saying it. Um, but always also we have to remember too that there will be someone in our midst who either has never heard it before or who having heard it before still has yet to apply it to themselves. All right? So that's what we do here on Sundays at St. Peter's. We rehearse the old, old story week in and week out constantly from different angles and, and seeking to apply it afresh to our lives every morning, seven days a week, 365 days a year. This is a good day to do that on January 1st, isn't it? We're starting the year off right. All right, that's enough anti-Santa anti business. All right, let's get to the real, the, the real thing here is where I was hoping to get to. We have to be quick about it, though. Um, so that's one misconception about Christmas and faith that we, you know, that we don't earn it. It's a free gift of God in Jesus Christ our Lord, right? That's how we're saved. The second misconception is this. It has to do with salvation itself. Um, a lot of people walk around thinking that forgiveness is that we have in Christ is simply avoiding hell and gaining heaven. And that's the sum total of the Christian religion. Sum total of the faith. And that couldn't be more wrong. It's true as far as it goes, but it is not the whole gospel, all right? And if you leave off the rest of the gospel, you are living this incomplete life, right? But a lot of our, and it's people like me that are primarily to blame for this, I believe, because we have not been giving the sheep, we've not been feeding the sheep the word of God in the full gospel, all right? And, and our imaginations are, are stunted. We need teachers, we need people to do this and tell us this stuff because we miss out on the completeness of the Christian life. Again, so let's follow on Paul's logic here. He was born of a woman. He was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Why? For fire insurance? To avoid hell? Is that it? That's just a bit of it. No, that is not the totality of the gospel. What does Paul go on to say? It came to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons, as legitimate children. As sons and daughters of the Most High, as princes and princesses of the King, legitimate heirs. I'm convinced that uh, most Christians walk around and they try to live the Christian life, yet they remain completely ignorant of this glorious truth. Or if they've heard it before, they've just forgotten it. You know, it doesn't impact them trying to impress it into you this morning. And, and because they don't pay the attention to this bit about adoption as sons and daughters of God, they miss out on the full power and punch of the gospel. They don't really apply it to themselves. And so they don't live as legitimate children of God. They don't live like they know that Jesus has set them free from Satan's tyranny. And so they walk around without joy, without hope, without a sense of being loved. They may even be truly converted, but sort of live this stunted, 
subpar Christian life. Right? And they lived their lives in unnecessary and tragic slavery. Defeated by sin, discouraged, downtrodden. All the while they have this infinite store of credit and power purchased for them by Christ, but they never cash the checks. All right? You all are gazillionaires in Christ, but the drawer of your desk is stuffed full of uncashed checks. We would rather live in a squalor of habitual sin rather than walk upright as noble sons and daughters of the Most High. We would rather live as if we had no hope of everlasting life. No kingdom promised to us, right? People that don't apply this adoption to themselves, they live unnecessarily in fear and anxiety as if they weren't being kept and guarded by the Almighty Himself. And they they walk around feeling alone and unwanted as if in his infinite love the Father had not in fact sent his Son to purchase them at the highest possible cost. Right? Precious blood of his own only begotten Son. You know, I've heard it said that there's nothing more ridiculous than a Christian without joy. No greater contradiction. No greater absurdity. That a Christian is not living in the freedom of their adoption and all the benefits that we have as children of God. If you are in Christ, and I pray you are, you have been adopted and made a legitimate and permanent heir of the kingdom of God. All right? God sent forth his son to redeem those who are under the law so that you might receive adoption as Sons, Get this into your head. Get it into your heart. Apply it to yourself. And everything starts to change once you do. If you don't, you forget this and you sort of let it slip in one year out there. Oh, that was a nice sermon. I'm not sure what he's talking about. Whatever. And you go on home and you just sort of go to lunch or Publix or whatever, right? Um, nothing will change. And you'll keep on going around being defeated and joyless and stuck in sin without a purpose, without hope without joy, without purity, without the freedom that properly belongs to a child of God, you're going to walk around like a slave. Walk around oppressed because you have not applied this to yourself. Paul here is calling us to pray for it, to beg God for it, to earnestly call out for a fuller understanding of what has already been given to us in Christ. It has already been given. Listen to Paul's tense as we continue on in our reading in Galatians. He goes on to say, because you are sons, you see how he's declaring the fact? If you are one who's trusting in Christ and you are a new creation and you are a child of God. All right? It's a fact. Not, oh, I wonder if... No, you are. All right? And so, because, he says, because you are sons already, God has sent, past tense, He has already sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This is not some sort of stuffy priest or stiff pastor, oh, Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we beseech you humbly. No. Isn't that garbage? That is not the spirit of his son in our hearts. By which he says we cry out, Abba, Father, Dad, Daddy, Papa. Yes, we need reverence. And sometimes our hearts need to remember who our Heavenly Father is. The Almighty God who dwells in light and inaccessible and is a consuming fire. But the wonder of the gospel is that this terrible and glorious God in heaven has instructed us through the gift of his son to call him Abba. To call him Dad. Keep both of those in tension and as power. Because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. 
As Paul says in Romans, you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear when you became a Christian. He says, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So pray with me now and let's call out to him together. Heavenly Father, the gift that you have given us in your Son defies imagination. The power of being able to call you, the Almighty, Abba, is a mix that is too, po too potent for us to take in. It's too wonderful just to fully understand. But Lord, may we receive it today by faith. May we understand that you have redeemed us to be your sons and all the rights and privileges that that brings with it. May we rejoice in this and be encouraged by this and set free in it. And we ask this for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, who made all these things possible. Amen.